So um, I've thought about how to let you know how I feel about how our teens and tweens are doing now. So I have kind of a funky job. I'm a clinical psychologist and a therapist. I work with our kids now. And in 25 years or so of practice, for the first time ever, I'm worried about our kids. Sincerely, honestly, collectively worried about our kids. And I thought, how am I going to get these guys to understand the degree to which I'm concerned? So I allow some kids I work with to text me in between sessions and let me know how things are going, if they're struggling with something, just a little catharsis so that they can make it from one session to the next. And with a nod to their confidentiality, I want to read to you some of the texts that they send me. Can you guys hear me okay? Yeah. All right, cool. So these are texts verbatim that I get from some of the kids that I work with, and this happens frequently. Hey, Dr. Duffy, I just can't help but feel that a lot of people I talk to think I'm an uninteresting person. Life just sucks, and everyone around me sucks too. I don't know why I stick around. I don't think my parents know how hard this is for me. They think I'm bad, just bad. My parents hate me because I didn't go to school. I'm a wreck, man. I don't know what's wrong with me. I need so much help. I'm anxious all day long, and that makes me depressed. Does it ever really get better? Yo, sorry for the random late-night texts I keep sending you. This is about 2.30 in the morning, in the middle of the week. But school just makes me feel so miserable. I really don't know if I can make it through the whole school year feeling like this. I can't help thinking I'm going to die soon. Hey, can you meet this week? My friend tried to kill himself and I didn't answer his message. I feel super guilty about it. I'm not gonna do anything, don't worry, but dying in my sleep, that would be the easiest thing. Everyone would feel better. I don't think anything gets better in college, definitely not after that. I'm just so unhappy right now. Everything is shitty. My life, the world, I'm not suicidal, I just don't want to be alive, you know? And then every morning, you guys, the calls come in. Dr. Duffy, she won't get out of bed. He seems super depressed. She seems incredibly anxious. I think we might be in crisis here. We're afraid he or she is going to hurt themselves. Do we need to go to the emergency room? Can we get in to see you today, this morning? We are in crisis here. So families are telling me on the daily they're in crisis here. Now. It's kind of an occupational hazard when you work with this age group that you're going to get that call once in a while. That's the truth. And if we go back three or four years, I got that call. And it happened maybe once a month, maybe twice on a rough month. I got that call twice this morning. I got that call three times yesterday. So something is changing, and it's changing pretty dramatically. Now. I never really thought I was going to write a second parenting book because about 10 years or so ago, I wrote a book called The Available Parent. No, please, take your seat. <laughs> take, take your seats. It's okay. I, did anyone read it? Did anyone ever, has anyone heard of The Available Parent? Ah, I see my former supervisor, Ed, has heard of The Available Parent. Thank you, Ed. <laughs> Thank you for your courtesy raise. <laughs> so. In The Available Parent, I made what I thought was a pretty elegant, lifelong argument for how we parent our teens and tweens best. And it went just like this. If you parent relatively free of your own fear and your own judgment and your own ego, and that's hard, think about that, my own fear, right? I'm afraid I'm not doing this right. I'm afraid something terrible is going to happen to my kid. My own judgment, right? I'm not doing this right as a parent. You're a terrible child, and I've been dealt a bad hand here. And my own ego, you know, why don't I get the Princeton sticker on the back of my car? If we can put that stuff aside most of the time, we don't have to be perfect, then by and large, we're in a safe lane. You know, things are going to go pretty smoothly. 
from childhood through the tween years, through adolescence, into adulthood, and you're never gonna have a situation where it's perfect. You're gonna get a Sienna report card. You're gonna have the moment where he or she comes home a little drunk, maybe have a problem or two, but by and large, things are gonna work out pretty darn well because the emotional bank account between you and your child is high, you're connected, you're available as an ally and a guide, a consultant, if they need you, so it's all, by and large, gonna work out pretty well. What I didn't know 10 years ago is how much was gonna change in the lives of our kids. I didn't know what vaping was. Neither did you. I didn't know what juuling was. I didn't know we were gonna run into an opioid crisis that was gonna swallow some of our kids whole. I didn't know our kids were gonna become so keenly aware of any hint of depression, anxiety, suicidal thoughts, attention difficulties, uh, hopelessness that they were gonna run into. And it was gonna be sticky for them because they could Google it, they could WebMD it, they could join groups online, it would become part of their persona. I didn't know our kids were gonna be familiar with all the medications affiliated with all these maladies and have pretty ready access to an awful lot of them. I didn't know our kids were gonna run into increasing academic stressors, worse than they were 10 years ago. I didn't know that school shootings and mass shootings were gonna become part of the everyday anxiety vernacular of our kids. I didn't know our kids were gonna run into so much social stress from virtually every corner of their lives, most markedly social media. And I didn't know that social media was gonna play such a a prime role in the self-worth and the self-esteem of our kids. I didn't know that the talks that we would normally have with our kids at 12 or 13 or 14 or 15 years old, or like my parents got away with, never, <laughs> that we would now have to start having with our kids as young as seven or eight or nine, because we all know our kids from a very young age have access to an awful lot of stuff, so we have to have all those talks about depression and anxiety and suicidality and violence and the stuff we never want to talk to our kids about. I didn't know our kids were going to run into what one girl I worked with called identity traffic. I have an identity I have to keep up with my parents, with my siblings, with my teachers, with my peers, with my coaches, with my bosses, with myself, and online. And I have to keep all those balls in the air while trying to live my life. Basically, I didn't know that our kids were going to be so overwhelmed from the moment they woke up in the morning until the moment they laid their heads down to sleep at night, never really knowing what it was like to feel off the grid the way we did when we were kids. And so that's what we're going to talk about tonight. We're going to talk about what's going on in the world of our kids. That's why I wrote this book, to give you a feel for what's going on now and a template for going forward with everything that's about to change in the lives of our kids, and hope. There are ideas in here that will help you to navigate all of it. And with that, I wanna, I wanna introduce Heidi Stevens. So I told them what was wrong. Can you take it from here? <laughs> um, I think you're also gonna tell us all how to fix it, aren't you? Hopefully we're going to get there. Yeah. yeah, it's you know what this book is. Um, it, it's as serious as John made it sound. It's also a, I think more, a little more joyful and hopeful than you made it sound. Um, <laughs> I, yeah, people are trying to sneak out. I can see. No, it's not. Um, okay, so first of all, I'm going to say you're John is here to talk about his book. You're here to talk to to listen to John talk about his book, but. Um, the reason I'm here, because John can do this without me and, and is going around the city and suburbs doing this Heidi without me. Heidi begged me to come yeah. in. <laughs> Let me be part of it. Um, <laughs> the reason I'm here is because I am a huge believer in John's wisdom and approach to parent, parenting um, since your first book, since Available Parent, which I, Ed, I also read it. Um, you're not the only one in the room. Uh, and... Um, so much so that when I wanted to start a podcast last year um, with the idea of having a weekly discussion on approaching the relationships in our lives with more intention and purpose, 
Um, the first person I thought of to, to ask if he would do that with me was John. And I just thought if there's anybody who is going to help guide me through this stuff and help guide listeners through this stuff in a way that I feel good about in a way that I feel is use, you know, useful for people and, and a good um, use of their time, it's going to be John. So, so I asked him to meet me for coffee at Starbucks, and I'm like, I know you already have a podcast with Julie, and it's fantastic, and you're writing a book, and you got a private practice, but do this with me. <laughs> and, and, and easy you, yes. And that was yes. an easy yes. Well, thank you. Um, so we have a podcast. It's called On Purpose, the Dr. John Duffy and Heidi Stevens Podcast? Podcast? Yeah. Something like very close to that. Right. Yes. <laughs> those, are, those are the key words if you're searching for it. Um, but, um, you know, I, I think we could start in a serious place, I suppose, yeah. um, based on some of those texts you read. I know that um, a lot of us probably in this room feel like, okay, the the approach that you talked about an available parent where you're sort of sort of the potted plant approach right like you're you're in the room with them you're available right. if they need you but you're not all up in their grill all the time yeah. you're not you know constantly how are you how are you? you're not checking the text you're not um that felt okay yep um and now you're saying maybe that's not enough right but we also don't want to become the snowplow parents yeah. who clear every obstacle out of the way and don't let our kids develop an inner life and a moral compass on their own, right? So yep. I think, am I right? A lot of people feel like, well, how would then what do I do? Like, which one? I need one or the other. And the truth is, there's something in the middle of yeah. those two things, right? Yeah, we, we really have to thread the needle between those two things because I think we all know that um, we don't want to do too much for our kids. We don't want to be too invasive in the lives of our kids, even though we have methods for doing that, right? There are portals and trackers and all sorts of ways to kind of keep track of what our kids are up to. But we also know when, at the end of the day, we want our kids to feel competent and resilient heading out the door at 17 or 18, off to college, off to the next adventure. And in order to do that, we need to allow them some birth to make some mistakes and try some new things. Um, and what I'm pointing out over here is, wow, some of the things they're going to try could be kind of dangerous. So the key is, and you're going to hear me repeat this over and over tonight, is to keep as open a line of communication as you possibly can with your children from a very young age. And I do get parents telling me, oh, that gets a little absurd. At some point in my child's life, they don't talk to me. I don't know how to get them to talk to me. It's normal if they don't talk to me a whole lot. And I don't disagree with that, but I also am not willing to concede to it either because it's too vital and too important to stay connected. And I can tell you from experience with a lot of families, that this can be navigated in that way. You can stay quite connected with your child and available as an ally and a guide and a consultant without feeling like you're snow plowing or you're helicoptering or you're tiger parenting or any of that stuff that we know can be toxic or take away from the normal and healthy development of our kids, if that makes sense. Well, you talk about um, the vibe in your house, that, right? That's actually, yes. I think, even a chapter title yeah. or, a, or a heading within a chapter, the vibe in your house. So talk about that and yeah. just how, how far that can go. Yep. So um, I learned this from kids. I, everything you're going to hear, I learned from kids. So um, an awful lot of kids have been telling me in the last decade or so um, that their main stress some of their stress comes in here, comes in school, right? A lot of it comes from their social life. A lot of their stress comes from social media. But a lot of kids will tell me, when I cross the threshold into, the, into my home, that's where it's most stressful for me. That's where I feel like I'm going to get interrogated about, you know, like, I looked at the portal and you didn't do your math homework and I can see that and you want to explain that to me. Or I've been tracking you and what are you doing at this kid's house? I told you I didn't want to hang, you to hang out with him or her. And they feel like, wow, somewhere along the line, mom and dad and I went from being 
close and having fun together, and now it feels adversarial, and they feel like people I need to work around as opposed to work with. And so if you can create a vibe in your home that is collegial and safe and also sanctuary. So a lot of the things I've been saying over there, Heidi, you're right. A lot, there was, there's a lot of negative going on in the minds of our kids. Their worlds are loud, really, really loud. Their minds are loud. I always focus on this idea that they rarely are able to achieve sanctuary in their minds. It's rarely calm for them. So they need home to be calm. We don't need to challenge them with more stuff in order to create grit and resilience and some of the words that you've been hearing the past few years. They're achieving enough of that by making it through the day. That's tough these days. Tougher than it was when any of us were our kids' ages. So if you can create a warm, comfortable vibe in your home that you enjoy, then I encourage you to do that because your child needs that from you. And if I can just add a little bit to that, um, probably the most important thing you can do in, in that regard is to light up for your child. And that might seem a little bit esoteric, and yet I bet if I interviewed each one of you one by one, you would kind of know what I meant. Because you probably all remember when you could light up for your kid. When, you're, when your child was this big or this big or this big, and you couldn't stop yourself from glowing when you saw your four-year-old or your six-year-old walk through the door. And somewhere along the line, you might have felt like, okay, I'm a little anxious now, so I'm going to have to police this child. And what that lands like on a kid is, oh, the lights have gone out. You no longer have that unconditional positive regard for me that you used to have. And I need that because I might not get that anywhere else. There might not be a teacher, a peer, a coach anywhere in this building. Um, and I might not look in the mirror and see anybody light up. So I need to know on the worst day when I've screwed up terribly, I need to know that I've got mom and dad and or dad on my side. And I can tell you having spent hours and hours talking with kids in my office ad nauseum, this matters to them. And they're gonna tell you it doesn't. Leave me alone, mom. Me, you know, dad, come on, I've I'm, I'm got things to do, you're bugging me. But if you light up for them, it matters. It weighs a lot to them and it carries them. So I don't want you to lose sight of that. Does that make sense? Cool. Okay, but there's also a chapter in your book called When Your Kid Seems Awful. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I thought maybe the editor was going to pull that one. <laughs> I'm just saying that some of us occasionally experience our kids not being the most pleasant. Yeah. Um, and maybe pushing some of our buttons. Yep. And so it's harder to light up than it was when they were, you know, a little snuggle bug. Yeah, yeah. Um, so and sweet and never doing anything, you know, like hardly ever vaping when you're holding hardly them like ever this. Hardly ever vaping. <laughs> really never vaping. Um, so, but your advice doesn't change. No. When your kid seems awful. No. So talk about that. Yes. So you're still leading with kindness and empathy and yep. you can't, you, no matter how hard you try, you can't force me out of your life. I'm not going anywhere. Right. 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 And, and part of this showed up on our podcast recently. So I'm going to give you a little credit for something here because you, you brought this moment that I, I cite frequently where I'm not sure if either of your kids did anything awful. No, but you were, absolutely not. They, they wouldn't, of course. But there might have been a dissonant moment, but you kind of had this feeling like, I'm never going to be the parent that is, you know, admonishing and angry at my kid. I don't want oh. that vibe. Do you remember what I'm talking about? When my about? son lost something on the L. Oh, right. Yeah, yeah. Right. And he was terrified to tell yes. me. Yes. So, uh, yeah. To, and I was like, oh, well, Bud will buy new ones. Yeah. And yeah, the yeah. earbuds aren't that big a deal. Right. It's okay. Yeah. That's right. like, you didn't get shot. So right. I don't, I'm certainly not upset. You just right. lost something. Yeah. We talked about how, like, you know, choosing in that moment, like, am I really going to try to go through life having raised kids who never lose anything? Like, is that my goal here? Like, you need to never lose anything or I will be disappointed in you. And that would 
be a, a, a losing battle. Yeah, well, then, and you lose him, yeah. right? It's kind of like, oh, right. mom doesn't have that regard for me. And again, it's not always, some of you are probably thinking, yeah, that's not a Deanna report card, though. And I just saw some of those, you know, yeah. <laughs> that's not like, right. you know, whatever or I at, found in this baggie terrible, in the back of the car. Yeah, or they're terrible to you. I mean, right. yelling. All they're the, mean. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yep. They Or they blow me off or they blew us off over the holidays or whatever. So on the worst day, Heidi's right. I, I don't change that rap. I still say on the worst day, there can be an awful lot of things that you feel like, you, we've got to change some things. We're going to have some talks about some things that need to change. But fundamentally, at the core, underneath it all, you and I are good. You know what I mean? So when your child walks through that door, the first thing he or she needs to know, the most important thing that he or she needs to know is we're connected, we're good, we're going to be fine no matter what. So that's the foundation of our relationship. We may have an argument for two hours today but you need to know that fundamentally at the core, we're okay, we're good, and I am your, I'm available to you. I am your ally, and I am your guide, I am your consultant. You can come to me no matter what. Doesn't mean I'm gonna be happy about it, but it doesn't mean you can't do it either. And that might feel like a really difficult needle to thread, but when you get a little bit of practice with it, it's actually easy, and it's way easier than navigating constant conflict and way too many families that I know end up in a lot of conflict with their kids and just just to give you a note on how that lands so oftentimes kids will tell me I will not give my parents the satisfaction of knowing I'm upset that they're upset with me but I am you know what I mean so I will go up to my room but I'll fall apart a little bit that does hurt me or I'll reach out to somebody else for comfort because I can do that because I have Snapchat up there. But it hurts me and I need, my, I need mom and I need dad on my side, on my team, especially with all this other stuff that's going on in my life that I can't really sort out all on my own. I need somebody who's an adult who can help me through that and, get, and provide me the safe space for the catharsis of anything I have to say, even if it's really, really something awful about myself, about something I've done, about something I'm afraid about, I need to know that person is going to listen with an ear that isn't judging me in real time. See, that feels so essential to me to, to hear, especially right now. We, I interviewed you once about suicide and you said that kids are walking into situations, almost any situation, already overwhelmed. Yes. Right? They're already overwhelmed. For some of the reasons you talked about and some of the reasons some parents and I were talking about before we started this, climate change is terrifying to kids. They're paying attention and they're terrified. School shootings are terrifying. I have, anytime I write about school shootings, I get some, somebody cranky who emails me and says, well, you know, I lived through duck and cover drills, you know, so what if they have active shooter drills? It's like, okay, but atomic bombs didn't actually fall right. on the schools. Yeah. So active shooter drills, they're living through something that is happening. Yep. Every few weeks, there's a school shooting, and they just had to drill for one. That's terrifying. It is so, terrifying. Social media, all of it, the academic pressure, all of it. So they are walking into almost any situation already pretty much at capacity, right? Yep. Emotional capacity, tension capacity. And they don't have a lot of bandwidth for another awful thing. That's what you said to me. They don't have a lot of bandwidth for another awful thing. And so imagine, like, you, the parent, being the awful thing. Right. Right? Who makes them feel like a failure or yep. a disappointment or... Name the... You name it, right? I mean, na name the negative that attribute them. that you right. feel about yourself, right? No, you're, you're, you're so right. And, and I think we can all recognize our kids, because they have a lot of access, they're worldly. They're also really kind, and they're really mm. empathic. And I, I don't know if you guys get to see this in your kids. I will tell you, I do. You know, and I, and I mean this sincerely. I, I see kids who are so thoughtful... And I honestly, if I'm being perfectly transparent, I think like, when I was 15, did I 
care about suffering anywhere on the planet? Or was I just glad, like, there's dinner here, so I think we're good. You know, I, 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 I don't know that we were so, you know, so thoughtful about, like, what was going on everywhere. But not only are kids thinking about it, they feel it. They mm -hmm. actually feel it. And they cannot stand the idea of suffering. Um, I, I talk a lot about, like, one um, element of this I find interesting is the idea of drunk driving. I, I'm not a drinker, I never have been, but I remember high school, and I remember not thinking twice about any of us getting into a car. You know, we're thinking like, oh, we're just driving through Park Ridge, what's the big deal? And you ask a 17-year-old now, you know, like, what's the deal with drunk driving now? It is extinct. I mean, it is just not happening mm -hmm. among young people today. And the idea of bullying, face-to-face -face bullying. There is very little tolerance anymore for this stuff. I know it still happens. I know it happens online, and that's a whole thing that we might even want to touch on tonight, but it's so different than it used to be. The cruelty, um, the lack of openness that a lot of us grew up with, we're raising better people, I think, in a lot of ways, but they're also very sensitive, and, and they're carrying an enormous emotional load that a lot of us didn't. One reason I pointed out this idea that kids are aware of mental illness is I grew up an incredibly anxious kid. I would have panic attacks in school almost every day, but because I didn't have many words to put to it or anybody to share it with, I was kind of like, okay, I'll go back to class now, the panic attack, or whatever the thing is seems over. Now, Kids are supporting each other. They're therapists for one another through a lot of this stuff. That's how much they care about the suffering of each other, and they carry it with them. It affects them in a really deep way. So I think just a few years ago, we used to look at adolescence as this very egocentric time, right? I care about me. I care about whether I'm doing okay, how I look, whether I have acne, whether I have a girlfriend or a boyfriend. Now kids really care just as much about each other. And that's wonderful, but it's also a burden. Mm -hmm. And we do not want to add to that burden. Yeah. Yeah. So let's talk a little bit about what happens online and what happens on their devices. I, I, I think every dinner party I go to, every gathering of grown-ups, we at some point end up on the topic of, like, how much of that stuff do you monitor, right? right. And I have friends who... They take the phone at night and they read through the text. Yep. Um, I have friends who don't do that at all. Um, I don't. I don't do it. To me, it feels like reading a diary. I. I know that's not a really accurate analogy because it's written to another person. Right. It's not totally personal. And certainly, if you have the agreement with your kid, hey, I read those texts. That's different than sneaking in and reading the diary. Still, anyway, what do you what do you tell parents to do? Because yeah. are you monitoring? Are you checking? Uh, hey, are you an online bully? Or hey, are you being online bullied? Or hey, what texts are you sending? Some of the texts are probably kid to kid therapy. Yep, a lot of them are. Yeah. So so the way to, I, I say um, to talk to our kids about that when they're starting. Um, when you first get them that phone, and that's happening at younger and younger ages. And I don't think that's altogether inappropriate, by the way, because as much as we don't like it, an awful lot of the way that our kids connect now, and they're not altogether ineffectual connections, they're meaningful to them, is through texting, through Snapchat, through Instagram. These are not unimportant connections. We might roll our eyes at them, but if you put yourself at 14 years old and if somebody handed you an iPhone and said, hey, you can contact all your friends all the time, right. <laughs> we'd be all about it, wouldn't we? I mean, we'd be on the thing eight hours a day, too, wouldn't we? And you can edit the photos of yourself. <laughs> right. right. I look amazing. <laughs> There's like filters and stuff. <laughs> right. Yeah. I can put a mustache on. I can do anything I want. Right. So. Um, right, so there's all these amazing things kids can do, and we end up playing tug of war, and I have a thought about like how to mitigate that. But um, it, it's also important to recognize that they are taking care of each other, and um, as parents, in order to monitor effectively and not create a rift in your relationship, I encourage parents to be transparent about what they're doing. 
I've had way too many parents of 16 and 17 year olds come into my office like a confessional and say, I looked at her phone last night, you know, and now I know something and I can't do anything with it, you know, and that's a really, really bad spot to be in as a parent. You can also make some really, really errant assumptions. I'm going to share a brief story with you because it's, it's ancient and it's kind of funny and it's kind of horrifying. I um, had a dad reach out to me. The first thing I woke up, like 6.15 in the morning, please, let's meet right now. As soon as you can get to the office, we have a crisis. And I, I get in the office. I'm like, okay, what's going on? I'm a little earlier in my career, so crisis means something different to me now. Um, and he said, you know, I jailbroke my daughter's phone. So I got in. I can see all the texts she ever sent and all the ones she ever received. And look, she's a prostitute. <laughs> and so I look, this girl's an honor student. She's brilliant. She's, you know, super kind. And I'm, I take a look at a few of the texts. And there's some language that teenagers use in there. And, you know, and so he's drawn this conclusion based on very limited data that, you know, oh, my God, my, my daughter's, you know, like I've been gaslit and now she's, you know, <laughs> leading this other life I have no feel for. And none of that was true. And I was able to calm him down pretty quickly. But if we become spies, that's really what we are. And our kids are smarter than we are in this regard. This is a big part of the reason I wrote this book. There are so many areas of our kids' lives where we're a step behind them. This, in particular, what goes on on the phones, we're always going to be a step behind. So if you think, like, I took his phone away, so he is off the Internet. And I, I've heard that so many times, and I'm like, yeah, I'm sure he is. And I'm sure he'll be off the Internet for as long as you say he's off the Internet, right? Uh, because there's no other way on besides that one phone. Um, <laughs> uh, so, so the better story it, and I always like to think in terms of what's the better story here? The better story is to create an alliance. Hey, this is new to you, so I'm going to trust you with this phone, but I'm going to keep all the passwords, and I'm going to look. And I'm going to look at what you put on Snapchat, and I'm going to look at what you read, and I'm going to look at what you put on Instagram, and I'm going to look at your text because I care about your health and safety, and I don't expect you to know what's safe here. So I'm going to help you with that. And I want you to be friends and allow access to your aunts and your uncles and some other adults too so that we can make sure you're safe. And gradually, over time, you can earn that right to have some privacy there. The problem comes when you deny them the privacy or you tell them, yes, you can absolutely have all the online access you want. We will never look. And then as soon as you, you know, like, have your child plug your phone into the kitchen, you're like grabbing it and like kind of like doing all the spy work you can trying to get to know your kid. And the better story is always just get to know your kid. You know, your kid is available for you to talk to. Maybe not in two hour long segments, but you get five or 10 minutes. You can share an earbud with them and you can listen to some rap music. You can watch Rick and Morty. If you think it's the stupidest thing that's ever been created and ask them, Tell me about this. What do you like about this? And I'm telling you, like that, that is a little deposit in the emotional bank account that will pay dividends somewhere down the road. But if you create something adversarial, then all they're going to do is work around you, and they're going to be really good at it, and it's going to frustrate you. Make sense? Do you think we give our kids enough room and practice at checking their own guts and listening to what their gut tells them when we have all these tools to intervene before they do something bad yeah. or, or operate and have them operate with the knowledge that I'm going to catch you doing the bad thing because right. I've got the thing that tells me the thing. Um, do they, <laughs> you can tell I'm really good at technology. <laughs> it's actually a technology podcast that we do. No, it's not. Um, <laughs> right. 
<laughs> yes, of um, course. But I'm serious. Do, I, when when there's all these measures that get in the way of them just having to like check their gut, how does this decision making me feel right now? Right. How did that decision I made yesterday leave me feeling? Yep. How does the anticipation of this thing I said yes to? What's feel. that doing to my gut? And then uh, bullying is a place where this shows up sometimes, right? Yeah. Like, you know, how do you think that feels? Or, like, yeah. that, I feel like you need to go through life. You need to learn how to listen to your insides yep. and say, like, you know, I don't feel good about that. Yep. Or, man, I feel good about that. Yep. Um, and do we let, do we, does we, this generation of parents, let the generation of kids we're raising do that enough? I think not nearly enough. No, I, th I think because we want, because we're anxious about, the things we don't really understand fully, we overregulate, and so we don't allow our kids the opportunity to do exactly what Heidi's describing, to kind of like check your own gut and make your own decisions based on what your ethic is, you know what I mean? And developing that ethic. Um, and kids are really good at this when they're allowed a birth to do it. Um, and, and this is one of the secrets of the therapy room that I would love for you guys to take over. I would love for you know you guys to take over the, hey, what's that like for you? Or what do you think this feels like for the kid on the receptive end? I'll drive Uber, you guys do this part. Um, but if you can get them thinking about like, you know, uh, e even if you catch them doing something you feel like, I don't like that a whole lot. Parents express this to kids a, a lot. Like, you know, I don't like what you did there. But the better question almost always is, how do you feel about it? And w without judgment, because kids will give you an honest answer if you reserve judgment. And sometimes they'll surprise you. Sometimes something you think is awful, they'll have a reason. And, you know, you want to hear that reason out. But you want to, it's a great point, Heidi. You really want to provide space for your child to develop an ethic on their own. And so the way to do that isn't to mandate. Um, a lot of us are living under the false impression that our words and our lectures carry some weight with our kids. <laughs> and man, I want to tell you guys like, yeah, keep it up. You're good. You got the best words. Rock on. Um, but I think fundamentally we all know the more we're listening to our kids, the more they're talking and we're listening, the further along the right path we are, right? And some of you might be thinking, my kid doesn't talk to me that much. It doesn't take that much. Sometimes it just takes these little sound bites or floating the question out there. Well, how does that feel to you? Or how do you think it feels to the kid who's receiving that? And you might not get verbal, you know? You might just get them thinking, hmm, I don't know. And then you can let them sit with that. But at least they're working this through and developing their own point of view and their own ethic. So I think that's a really good, good important point. Well, and maybe you've planted a seed, right? Because I think the beauty of teenagers versus little kids is it, it doesn't all have to happen in the moment, right? Like you don't have to discipline them in the moment. You don't have to fix the thing before they stick their finger in the socket in the moment. Like you can, you can talk about it two days later. You can say it now, and they're going to still be thinking about it two days later because they've got these big, beautiful, developing brains in a way that like a three-year-old doesn't, right? So you could say... How do you think that made Jason feel? Yeah. Um, and in the moment, they'd be like, fucking no. Um, <laughs> but, th but maybe in bed that night or two nights later, they're thinking like, I wonder how that did make Jason feel. Yep. And they may even come back to you with it. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, I was thinking about what you said the other day, you know? Right. Um, and as a counterpoint, um, what sometimes what we tend to do, and I'm revisiting a point I, I made a moment ago, but this happened in my office last night. I had a family in there, and there's a boy who clearly smokes too much pot, right? And so I could feel dad sitting um, in a particular power chair in my office that nobody ever sits in, but it sits <laughs> just a couple inches higher than the rest of the chairs. So it's like, you know, he knows, like, I think I'm king of this office right now. <laughs> and, um, and he took this opportunity thinking, the therapist over here, he's going to back me up. And so I'm going to, I'm going to take this opportunity to, um, to offer you all of my wisdom, son, because I know I have your attention for these few minutes. And it's painful to watch a child 
drift off. And so you always, when, when you're the therapist, it's, it's easy to see, and you often ask, and I did last night, how quick did dad lose you? Was it within a minute? Was it within 30 seconds? Did you know what he was going to say? And oftentimes I'll ask a, a, a parent, stop for a second. Can you finish it? Can you, the child, finish the lecture? And I guarantee you, the child of anybody in here could not only finish your lecture, but do it in your voice with your inflection. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, <laughs> you know, like with all of your movements and the whole thing, you know, getting up and walking around. I can't believe, you know, the, the whole thing, your, your kid can do that. So, you, so, so what I want to say is you can spare yourself that moment. You do not have to do that, you know? It's, way, it's a way better story, and you'll hear me repeat this phrase a couple of times tonight, to offer them some space to talk about what it is that they're thinking, what it is that they're feeling about the topic at hand, instead of filling all the space. Because you can hear from what both of us are saying, your kids need your regard and the breadth to say the thing that's hard to say. No matter what that is, no matter what area of life that's in, if you provide that for your kids at this difficult time to be a kid, man, you're doing some good parenting work. It's mighty and it's hard because I know it's anxiety provoking to be a parent right now, right? It's scary because, because the therapist just told you there's 50 things to be afraid of, <laughs> right? But the way to mitigate that isn't to talk, talk at your child about it. It's to talk with your child about it. And kids have really, really great ideas on just about anything if we give them the moment and the respect to offer them. It's hard to do because you really have to park your anxiety in the back and just let them have the moment. I have no idea whether I answered your question. <laughs> oh, you for sure did. <laughs> so, so dialogue rather than monologue. Ab yes. Okay, and so um, I, this is on my mind because I just interviewed Peggy Orenstein Tuesday night, who I know did a fan event Monday night. She just wrote Boys and Sex, um, which is a great book. Um, and what she found when she spent a couple years interviewing 16 to 22-year-old males about sex and intimacy and their experiences and their expectations and... Um, what sort of expectations they feel are put on them. It, uh, she said, you know, she went into that project thinking like all their answers are going to be like grunts, basically, or like, mm. yeah. And they all <laughs> opened up and shared all sorts of stuff with her hopes, fears, regrets. Um, and they also were like, well, just nobody had ever asked. Right. Nobody talks to me about that stuff. Mm. Um, as much as parents don't talk to their daughters about sex and intimacy, they talk to their sons even less. So, and we've talked, we did a podcast about this, but, but I think that, I think we go into these parent conversations dreading them because we're like, oh, they don't want to have it. They're not going to say anything. Right. I don't um, want to have it. I also don't yeah. want to have it. Let's just not have it. And I think maybe they on some level want to. Yeah. Um, I think we fear it sometimes more than they do, and I think something simple as like, um, I'm really nervous about having this conversation with you. Yep. Being I, a little meta about it. Yep. I don't even know where to start, bud, but it feels way too important to not have it. So like. So here comes our awkward moment. Here comes we're, me we're, being awkward. We're diving in, pal. Right. Yep. I mean, that's got to go a little ways, right? A long ways. A long ways. It's, it's huge. To, to You don't have to be perfect any more than your child has to be perfect. And I totally agree. Like, you know, if you are willing to say, I'm not comfortable with this, I'd really rather prefer never to have this talk or to have this talk five years from now with you, but it's too important. And so we're going to have it, and we're going to have it more than once. You know what I mean? So you don't get to do what a lot of our parents did and say, you know, like, here's what happens with, you know, the, the cucumber and the cantaloupe and let's, move. Yeah. <laughs> sorry. Um, I don't know but, you but that, that was fifth grade for me. So I just thought I'd leave it out there. Um, uh, yeah. So, I mean, it, it's important to engage in those talks and to, and it's perfectly fine and probably pretty good modeling 
to talk about in a meta way what these talks are like for you because that gives your kid permission. You're modeling something really important there. That gives your child permission to do the same when they're talking to a significant other mm -hmm. about um, sex or something in, in their own relationship or to a friend about their feeling suicidal, you know, um, or somebody 10 years from now. You're modeling something that's really, really crucial and really, really important to them. And one thing I think we're walking around and we haven't quite said yet is the key to all this is safety, it is for your child to feel like, okay, this is a safe space and mom and dad are safe people to talk to. One thing you, you notice in doing therapy with kids is the minute they recognize this feels safe to me, mm -hmm. they just go, just like Peggy Orenstein's talking about. And kids, you would, parents will prep me like, you know, okay, he or she is willing to come in just barely. I'm not even sure I'm going to be able to get them there. Don't plan on them saying a word to you. And I'm so used to this that I'm like, just get them in the room. Just get them in the room. I'll handle it from there. And oftentimes, as soon as I can get mom and anxious mom or dad out of the room, <laughs> kids are like, just talking. They're telling their story with ease. And I always wish there was a camera poised behind me so I could introduce this amazing child to their parent who may never have met them like this. And that, that to me is the, one of the scariest things. So I don't worry that much about kids because I think by and large, if they can make it through some of this morass, I think most of them are going to be perfectly fine and pretty well equipped and resilient to the world. Sometimes what I worry most about is us, the parents, and that we're going to be the ones left in the dirt because we weren't available when they needed us. So that's my biggest concern. That's a big part of the reason that I've written both of these books is in part because I want the kids to feel heard and understood and listened to, but also that you get them for a lifetime. That, that's huge, right? You don't want to be done like, okay, you're 18, bye. It's been really nice to know you. I'm done with my job, so I'm going to chill and Netflix. That's not, that's not <laughs> I think the, it's the, Netflix and chill. I think you did the wrong order. <laughs> You're way hipper than I am. I don't know what a whole, you know. <laughs> yeah. I felt like we were in a safe space and I could say that. <laughs> I think it's Netflix Well, I feel chill. a little threatened, Heidi. <laughs> <laughs> but next time you'll say it right. Yeah. <laughs> I suppose that's true. <laughs> saying. Um, so I know we want to get to questions in a second, but I, two points I want to make that I loved in the book. When you talk about awe and wonder, because yeah. I just feel like this is such an important thing to learn. Um, so you talk about how kids become these like discerning pragmatists way younger now, yeah. um, and they learn to like lift the veil and look behind the thing super young. They're already cynical. They're yep. already skeptical. And, it's and scared. And scared. Mm -hmm. And it's really hard to instill awe and wonder in them. Yeah. It's sort of the, those are sort of the prices that they pay, right, for becoming these kind of like savvy skeptics. Yep. yep. Um, and the thing that you say can instill awe and wonder in them is experiences, yeah. right? Never stuff. It's never going to come from stuff. Never stuff. I think, I think we kind of know that. I mean, if you think back to the last set of holidays, I, I've talked to so many families and they're like, I have no idea what to get my kid. There's nothing they want. There's nothing that's not on the phone or on the, you know, on some screen. There's no thing that they want. There might be, you know, like a hoodie, you know, but, um, you know, that's not going to, uh, that's five minutes in Target, right? Um, but if we create experiences for our kids, what we're going to get, and, and a lot of you are probably thinking this is, I don't want to go on a family thing. I don't want to hang out with you people at all. And yet, when kids get out there and they do things with their families, they love it. They, and and they, they love engaging in new experiences. And they do get filled with awe and wonder. And they do come back to their therapist and they say, oh man, you wouldn't have believed how amazing this trip to Europe was. You, you can create really unforgettable memories that they truly are in awe of. So for those of you who <clears throat> grieve that your eight and nine and 10 year olds 
are no longer little and no longer kind of in that place where life feels magical, if you provide a cultural experience for them, if you provide an experience where they're volunteering and they see in the face of somebody across from them that they're appreciative, kids are blown away by that. This, this fills their souls. And again, I suspect they might not share that with you, but they do share it with me and they share it with other therapists I know. So I know that's true. And that is one of my favorite moments too, because I feel like I spend a lot of time in the book talking about what we lose at a very young age, but we don't necessarily lose it. We can reinstill that at any time. Another way to do it, um, one of my favorite stories and client experiences, I worked with a father and a son. And um, the father was very judgmental of his son's musical taste. What do you listen for the rap for? You know, like, you, what's with all the swearing? I listen to the Eagles, and they didn't swear, and, <laughs> you know, and so... They didn't do drugs. Huh? They, they didn't do drugs. They didn't do drugs, right? You know, right. No, the Eagles? Of course not. Um, and, and so the deal... So, so they struck a moderate deal where it was, okay, when we're in the car... I'll pick a song, and then you pick a song. Mm. And then this escalated into, okay, I'll pick a concert that we both go to, and then you pick a concert that we both go to. And the cool thing was, so the kid would come back and say, you know, like, I saw Bob Dylan, man. That was unbelievable. <laughs> like, how cool was that? Um, but the dad will come back and say, yeah, Kid Cudi's kind of cool. Like, you know, like I didn't realize he has his roots like deep in rock and roll. And, and so these guys are learning from each other. But underneath it all, they're really connecting in, in ways that are so beautiful. And you feel like I can see it lasting for a lifetime and going through generations where they share music together. And that is really potent and really powerful and also draws us awe and wonder, yeah. right? And connection. Yeah. Yeah. I love that. Um, okay. Now we're going to get to questions. I'm going to close. Well, I shouldn't assume I'm going to close because you might want to say something. But the last thing I'm going to say is a quote from the book. And you address dads specifically with this quote, which I love because so much of parenting advice is directed at moms. And I think dads get left out, and I think sometimes dads leave themselves out, but I think often they get left out uh, out of their control. Mm -hmm. um, and um, I also think this just goes for parents, but you say, this is the most important work we will do in our lives, guys. It's where the joy is and what will keep us young. Don't give it away. You'll miss all the good stuff and wonder why you're burning out. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, yeah, I guess I'll add just a, a, a little bit to that. Right, so that, that was directed specifically to men because I feel like we guys sometimes miss out. I'm, I'm really um, heartened to see so many guys in the room because historically when I've talked to groups, I don't see that many guys. So it's really cool to see. Um, but um, I, I think you and I both, Heidi, are pretty... I think we would be pegged as idealistic parents, but I think we like the way we parent our kids, mm -hmm. you know? And part of that is um, what I say often, and Matt, it, I'm going to apologize in advance because it is the cheesiest thing, and I wish <laughs> I had a different way to say it. I don't. My apologies. Um, I like to think of parenting as this light that you and your child hold together forever, the two of you, right? And it's this beautiful messy, awesome, wretched thing that you guys get to hold on to together forever. And I'm fortunate enough, um, and I'll just speak from my own experience for a second here. Um, I have one child. His name is George. He's 24 years old. And because I feel like I've, been, I've learned from so many families, I, um, have, I feel that connection with him to this day. I feel like I could reach out to him. I feel like he thinks about me every day. I know I think about him every day. And I feel like we have this lifelong connection. If I had a wish for everybody in this room, it's that. So we get so stuck in the drama of the day that we forget, oh man, I love these people. I love these people that I'm charged with kind of 
guiding through these times. And I'm not here to make them in my image. I'm here to be in awe myself of who these people are becoming. So if I can get into that space and step back and allow the process to be theirs, not linear, not some narrow little definition of success, man, am I doing it right. And you will hold that connection forever. And it's the biggest thing in your life. It's the most important thing any of us are going to do. It's why we're here, right? It's freezing out. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you, guys. Yeah, thank you.